Okay, so now we're continuing with our reading of the Anguttara Nikaya in the Book of Sixes. And this time we're taking Sutta number 13, which has the title of Escape. And you'll, you could see here that the theme are six elements of escape, the Saraniya Datuyo. And the word, the Nisaraniya is an adjectival form based on the noun is Nisarana. Which is the word that I translate as escape. And you can see that this comes from the prefix nis or actually it's near, plus sarana. Yeah, so the idea of escape becomes a little bit, uh, let's say a little bit controversial in relation to Buddhism, since people think that if you are aiming at escape, therefore to follow Buddhism is a kind of escapism but actually there's really a difference between escape and escapism. What is meant by escapism is refusing to face reality and trying to lose yourself to dampen or weaken the beam of consciousness, the clarity of awareness by using certain substances or engaging in certain activities that protect you, and prevent you from seeing into reality, seeing the truth. But what the Buddha's teaching aims at is nisarana, and the prefix near has the sense of out of, going out of, and sarana has the sense of going or even running. So it's a way of going out, running out of undesirable conditions. And we see this word sarana in other contexts, the, the main part. We see it when we become a follower of the Buddha. What do we do? What is the primary activity to make one a follower of the Buddha? Sarana. Take refuge, Bhante. Yeah. So in English, in Pali, we say sarana gamana. So that is going for refuge. So the sarana is what brings one out and thereby serves as a refuge. So that is the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. Yeah, there's another word with sarana, but we know it in a somewhat different form. Sangsara which comes from the verb sangsarati. So sangsarati is to go on, to continue going, to continue running, to run on, to wander on. And that is to wander on through jati sangsara, the round of repeated birth and death. And so we could say that sangsara and the sarana are in a way opposites so as long as we remain blinded by ignorance and driven by craving or by the defilements, we wander and roam in sangsara and we sangsarati, we wander on and on. But when we encounter the Buddha's Dharma and then we take refuge, we go for refuge, we go sarananga chami, buddhang sarananga chami. I go for refuge to the Buddha, dhammang sarananga chami. I go for refuge to the dhamma, sangang sarananga chami. I go for refuge to the sangha. So we go for refuge, that's saranagamanang. And then we start practicing the teaching. And as we practice the teaching, then we are moving towards nisarana, going out gaining release from these 
undesirable, oppressive, miserable conditions of repeated, potentially boundless and infinite birth, growth, aging, and death. Okay, so here in this sutta, the Buddha is going to explain six elements of escape. So let us move into the text. Okay, so the first element of escape, so it's introduced in this way. And here the Buddha is bringing up, for each one, he's bringing up a hypothetical situation. So here we might have a monk or anybody else who might say, I have developed and cultivated the liberation of the mind by loving kindness. So this is, in Pali, this is the metta ceto vimuti. And then the mode of development is qualified and described with various expressions that one has made it my vehicle. And the word here is iana. So this is just like we speak and when we sometimes when we classify the Buddha schools, we sometimes say there's the distinction of Hinayana, <laughs> the little vehicle or low vehicle, and the Mahayana, the great vehicle, <laughs> or the Vajrayana, the diamond vehicle. But here the Buddha is using the word yana as a way of describing the practice of metta, loving kindness. You make it your vehicle, that in which you travel. So you undertake the practice, repeated practice of metta, and you are using it as your vehicle, your way of traveling to this liberation of mind. And then you make it the basis. Vatu. Vatu, the original sense, is the land on which one builds a house. And so it's something, you know, solid foundation. So you make it your vehicle, your basis, you carry it out, you solidify it, and then you thoroughly, <clears throat> thoroughly or properly undertake it. So somebody is making that claim. And yet, he says that still sometimes ill will obsesses my mind that this person will give rise to ill will to to hatred to aversion and so then the text continues this person should be told this monk who's making this claim do not say so, do not speak in that way, don't misrepresent the Buddha, the Blessed One. The Buddha wouldn't speak in such a way. Then the important point, it's impossible and inconceivable that you could develop and cultivate the liberation of the mind by loving kindness, even to this extent, in all of these ways, and yet, ill will could still obsess your mind. There is no such possibility, for this is the escape from ill will, namely the liberation of the mind by loving kindness. Okay, this passage needs a little bit of unpacking. First, the text speaks about the liberation of the mind by loving kindness. Do you see the notes file? Is that visible? Yes, Bande. Okay. Yes, Bande. We can see it. Okay. So we have the liberation of the mind by loving kindness. Okay. Now, we have different types of liberation of mind, ceto vimuti, and 
let us say, we could have liberation of the mind through the jhanas, through the Brahma Viharas, which we're going to see in this sutta, and then liberation of mind connected with wisdom that is called Panyavi Muti. That is the liberation of mind that comes about through liberation by wisdom. And that is also called the unshakable liberation of mind. And now that we use the expression in relation to the jhanas, to the Brahma Viharas, that we use the expression liberation of mind, that expression does not mean that through these practices, the mind is totally liberated, completely liberated from the defilements. But rather this kind of liberation through the jhanas, through the divine abodes, the Brahma Viharas, is still shakeable. It's not invul invulnerable. It's not a final or perfect liberation of mind but it is a kind of temporary liberation of mind by which the defilements are held in check and can't arise and obsess the mind and take control of the mind. But the defilements are still present in a kind of subtle suspended state. Yeah, the commentary sometimes make a distinction of three levels at which the defilements can occur. Level of transgression or So at the level of transgression, the defilement is strong enough to motivate some, you could say, defiled or unwholesome action of body or speech. So that is a defilement manifesting in action. Okay, the second level, the defilement doesn't manifest in action but it gains possession of the mind. It appears in the mind. Maybe we'll call this mental manifestation. So in other words, the defilement takes the control of one's thoughts and emotions. And then at the third level, the level of latent tendency, the defilement doesn't cause transgression and action, it doesn't crop up into the mind, it doesn't manifest in thoughts and emotions, but the defilement remains still in a latent condition. Say at the base of the mind. And so we have different sort of practices to control the defilements at these levels. So the antidote to defilements manifesting in action <laughs> the antidote to this will be observing precepts and other ethical codes. The antidote to the obsessive 
manifestation of the defilements is basically the practice of samadhi meditation. So this can be through the jhana attainments or through the practice of the Brahma Viharas. And so when you get sort of strong samadhi, then the defilements don't appear at all. And so some practitioners who have a lot of skill in samadhi, able to enter all four of the jhanas, sometimes the formless meditations, to practice the Brahma Viharas, will think that they have achieved final liberation, that they're completely free of the defilements. But that might not be the case if they haven't developed the wisdom to a high degree, because these defilements will still remain in that latent condition at the sort of bottom layer of the mind. And so the antidote to the defilements and the subtle latent condition is the development of insight wisdom. So it's the insight wisdom seeing into the true nature of dharmas, of phenomena that cuts at the very roots of the defilements and eradicates them. And so when the sutta here, when the Buddha is claiming that if one successfully develops the liberation of the mind by loving kindness, that ill will can't obsess one's mind, he's speaking about the development of loving kindness to the level of deep samadhi, where it will prevent ill will, the defilement of ill will, prevent it from manifesting in the form of the emotion of ill will and thoughts of ill will. But the practice of metta, of loving kindness by itself, even to a very high level, is not alone capable of eradicating the defilements or eradicating ill will. That needs the development of insight to the level of the world transcending the super mundane paths. And specifically in this case, the path of the non-returner, the anagami. It's only the non-returner who's completely eliminated ill will. Okay, so this is the first um, element of escape, using the liberation of the mind by loving kindness as the way of escaping from ill will. And I have to add also, even though this kind of liberation of the mind is not the final liberation, but still for just about all of us, it's beneficial to do the practice of the loving kindness meditation even if we don't reach that level of deep samadhi, of the true Brahma Vihara through the practice of loving kindness, but we can from time to time make it our vehicle, get in and travel in it. And you'll see that it brings great happiness and peace and loving thoughts and feelings towards others and it will have the effect of also creating harmonious relations in whatever community you are immersed in, whether family, neighborhood, society. It's always beneficial. Okay, now we come to the next element of escape, and that is actually the first four, as you'll see, are going to be the four Brahma Viharas, the divine dwellings. So now we come to the second element of escape, and that is the liberation of the mind by compassion. And so the difference between metta and karuna, of course, compassion is karuna. 
karuna. So metta is the wish for the well-being and happiness of others, actually oneself and others. And then compassion is said to be the quality that makes the heart tremble or shake with the suffering of others. And compassion manifests in the wish for those who are afflicted with suffering to be free from suffering. And so first we establish loving kindness because you wish good for others, wishing others to be well, happy and safe. And then when you witness or hear about others undergoing suffering, then there are, that loving kindness transforms into the wish for those for those afflicted people to be free from suffering. And so you develop the liberation of the mind by compassion. And then the sutta says that you make it, this is the, what the person is claiming, that they've developed this liberation of the mind by compassion, made it their vehicle and so forth. Yet the thought of harming I think this is the Hesa, which is related. I think it's just a variant on the word. The Hingsa still obsesses my mind. That is the thought of harming others, of inflicting injury upon others, of exploding in violence towards others, either physical violence or verbal violence, insulting others, hurting their feelings, speaking sarcastically to others, or even at the subtler level, just giving rise to these thoughts and intentions of harming others. So that is considered the sort of direct opposite, the enemy of compassion. When you have compassion when you witness other people undergoing suffering, then you want to rescue them from suffering. If you don't have compassion, in fact, if you have the opposite kind of mind, the mind of cruelty, then when you see others undergoing suffering, then you might delight in their suffering and even encourage some to inflict suffering on others. Okay, so that is what is said in the sutta, but I would also, and this is my own personal opinion, that there's another kind of subtler enemy, a softer enemy of compassion. Any idea what that might be? Indifference? Great. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, that was exactly what I was thinking. In, indifference to the suffering of others. So when you see others undergoing suffering, you hear about it, and you, know, you just think, ah, that's the way it is. Or oh, that's their problem. I'm not going to deal with it. Or it doesn't concern me, so let me just go my way. Okay, so continue. Yeah, one could give a whole speech about that, but I won't do that now. Because <laughs> I think, you know, maybe the real problem in today's world is not so much that people actively indulge in thoughts of harming others, but too many people are just indifferent to the suffering of others. And so that suffering is allowed to continue, especially in the form of violence, war, cruelty, racial, religious, ethnic, violence, discrimination, and so forth, gender-based discrimination and violence. Okay, so here, the person who makes that claim should be told, don't misrepresent the Blessed One, he wouldn't speak in such a way, and then 
it's impossible and inconceivable that if one develops and cultivates this liberation of the mind by compassion, makes it one's vehicle, that the thought of harming or injuring others could arise and take control of one's mind. So again, this is said with reference to somebody who has developed the meditation of compassion really to the extent of a full, full-fledged Brahma Vihara, that liberation of mind, so that it is utterly overshadowed and suppressed all tendencies towards harm and affliction and inflicting harm on others. But it doesn't mean <clears throat> that that tendency to harm others has been eradicated. Again, that tendency can still be there at the level of the latent tendencies. And unless it's uprooted by wisdom, if the person doesn't develop, continue to maintain the development of compassion, then that thought of, of harming or of injuring others can arise again. So this is really, we could say it's a temporary, or maybe provisional is better. It's a provisional escape from the thought of harming, the liberation of the mind by compassion. Okay, then we'll come to now to the third um, element of escape. And this, we'll see, is the liberation of the mind by altruistic joy, mudita. And, yeah, it's a, a little difficult to translate this word, you know, concisely without need for some explanation. The word mudita itself simply means joyfulness. But one could see from other contexts in which it occurs that it is directed out to other beings in the world. So in other words, it is the way it is explained in the commentaries and upheld in the tradition. It is rejoicing in the happiness and success and good qualities of others. So if you participated in our Thanksgiving retreat, um, finding joy in the wholesome, we had some sessions, actually just about half a day on the mudita meditation, both rejoicing in the simple happiness of others and then rejoicing in the virtues, the good qualities and excellent qualities of others. Okay, so that is the liberation of the mind. So this, also this meditation of altruistic joy can be developed to the level that it becomes an actual liberation of the mind. Again, it's a temporary, provisional liberation of the mind, but one which is solid, enduring, and which keeps all the defilements in check. And the defilement, which is said here to be directly opposed to mudita, is discontent, arati. So we could say that this is unhappiness, discontent, lack of delight. I remember Jnana Moli in some places, Venerable Jnana Moli had used the word boredom. I don't really know if I would go along with that. But arati, it's simply the, the absence of rati. Rati is delight enjoyment and arati is the lack of delight and this 
is a problem, I have to say, that comes in to people who take their Buddhism a little bit too seriously. <laughs> Don't you think so? Sometimes, you know, because we get constantly bombarded, everything is dukkha, 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 old age, sickness, death, dukkha, <laughs> five aggregates, dukkha, not to get what you want, dukkha, craving is the cause of dukkha, have to renounce, give up, relinquish. So everything seems very dark, very grim. And then you get into this really almost sort of dreadful, tight mental state. I've observed this quite often in monks, and I have to say Western monks more than Asian monks. Asian monks brought up in the tradition know sort of the ways of cultivating joy, but sometimes the Western monks take Buddhism too seriously, <laughs> and then they become very serious, very serious practitioners. So if you smile, they look at you and think, you're, you're not practicing correctly. <laughs> If you're practicing correctly, you have to go <laughs> go around looking a bit like and, and I, <laughs> I've even noticed this is when I was in Sri Lanka, when we look at sort of the official photographs of eminent Sri Lankan monks, for some reason, they think when they pose, they always have to have that, <laughs> that grim expression on the face. And I know some of them, and when you meet them, interact with them, they're always smiling, laughing, joyful, but as soon as the camera comes out and says, official photo, <laughs> the face changes. <laughs> okay, so like one of the ways to sort of counteract that sense of lack of delight, not boredom, but grimness. Yeah, that's a good, a good, that sort of grim mood. or ultra seriousness is through the developing the mind of altruistic joy. So again, it's to be made a vehicle and so forth. And then somebody comes along and says, um, They say that I've developed the mind of mudita, of altruistic joy, made it my vehicle, and so forth, and yet discontent still obsesses my mind, so that person should be told, do not speak in that way, don't misrepresent the Blessed One. And then the key point is that, that it's impossible inconceivable for one who has developed that mind of altruistic joy for discontent to obsess their mind. No such possibility. And then that is the escape from discontent, namely altruistic joy. Maybe at this point, I'll ask whether we have any questions on the first three avenues or elements of escape. Yes, Bhante, may I ask a question? Yep, please. 
Um, so um, in terms of metta, I'm not sure exactly which 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 word, but as a lay person, how do you um what what should go on in the mind when you are standing up to yourself in this world we live in? When when you are what? Standing up for yourself. So you mean when somebody is trying to um to critic? Like, no, for example, for example, uh, I'm just very recent. Two days ago, I had a car crash and my not my um, fault, and you know my car is totaled, and so now you know my I'm behind twenty thirty thousand dollars, right? I had to do something, and everybody's saying you know um, get the person at fault, you know, go for a lawsuit and uh, sue them and stuff like that. But I feel like, okay, it was an old lady, probably, you know, she was on the phone, but it's an old lady and I don't want to um, do any harm to somebody like that or anybody for that. No, you have to stand up for yourself. If, the, if you feel that you're being unjustly treated, exploited. So um, how do you, in your mind, it tightens the mind to say, no, you, you, oh, this person did something bad and I am at a... I need to go after and protect myself, but it does make your mind hard. It makes your mind what? Hard. Hard. Yes. And I don't know no, how, to, you do how it, to... You do it with loving kindness. You could even bring that person into your mind, even visualizing the person, and then you can generate, especially if you've been doing like regular practice of metta, of loving kindness, then you just sort of turn back and bring up that practice and then generate the thoughts of loving kindness towards that person. And then once you direct the loving kindness towards that person, then you can speak firmly in defense of yourself, standing up for yourself. It doesn't mean that you have to allow um, people to take advantage of you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I remember many years ago, there was this meditation teacher in India. He was actually the teacher of Joseph Goldstein, Anagarika Munindra. And there were some American women who would come to practice meditation with him. And they were telling Munindra that some of the Indian men were like when traveling on buses were in ways, it's a bit disgusting, but was sort of with their, letting their hands wander to places where they were not invited. And Munindra said to the women, you have an umbrella, because you always carry an umbrella around in India. Use the umbrella to give them a little whack. <laughs> okay, Yudi. Okay. Hi, good morning, Bante. Go ahead. Yes. Um, can you, uh, how, do, how do I rejoice in terms of mudita? How do I rejoice in, in the good qualities of others? Can you give me an example? <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe I think the, rec oh, I have to send it to Jason. The recordings from the Thanksgiving retreat. So we did like okay. a whole session of that, but basically what we do, the way I did it is we start at the top thinking of the Buddha, then rejoicing in the good qualities of the Buddha, then moving down through all of the generations of the disciples of the Buddha, then thinking of teachers and followers from other religious traditions who have good qualities, and then thinking about people in secular spheres of life, like self-sacrificing doctors, devoted teachers, journalists who are out to reveal the truth, um, relief workers, and then even our own friends and people in our own circle of acquaintances who have show kindness, compassion, generosity. And we do this sort of, it's a reflection, but 
you don't just stop with the thoughts, but you bring up the thought and then you try to let that joy, that rejoicing in the good qualities bubble up from the heart. Okay, so for example, like, okay, like if uh, at work, usually when you uh, go to work and the people that you work with, um, they get in paid um, to do something or to like maybe train you or to help you with certain things. Um, can I still rejoice in those qualities, uh, even though they get in paid? Yeah, it's, that's no problem at all. Okay. Just okay. As they're, if they're doing it with showing like a say if they're training you in something and they show a real interest they're really concerned to to see that you learn particular mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> procedures mm -hmm. and they go out of their way to be helpful then you rejoice in those qualities okay it doesn't matter that they're being paid okay yeah just okay. like like doctors are paid for their work mm -hmm. the teachers are paid but if the doctor is really dedicated to helping and the teacher is dedicated to teaching mm -hmm. the students then one rejoices okay all right thank you bante okay samantha jayatilika yeah thank you bante um i was just wondering you know um earlier on you were saying that word um indifference um i presume that's not the same as equi the the brahma vihara equanimity Upeka. Um, because I, I find that also a bit uh, difficult to understand because sometimes, you know, in situations where you feel for the other person, it's so difficult to be equanimous. You want to do something, like especially in political situations where there's injustice. Um, but in terms of Buddhism, um, I understand, I don't know, from previous talks, um, like monks don't really are not allowed or allowed or i'm not sure whether that's true but should, oh um uh, like in buddhism mm -hmm. where the monks are allowed to sort of like you know if there's political injustice take part in demonstrations i mean they're not that's not seen to be good um you know proper buddhist ways so how would one um get involved in social injustice but still be equanimous through buddhism Advantage. Yeah, I think there's a difference yeah. between equanimity and indifference. Indifference means that you don't really care about a certain situation, a certain issue. Equanimity, as we're going to see, because it comes next up, maybe we just go into the next term on the lineup, and maybe that mm. will be. So please okay. see, just hold the questions. Thank you, Bhante. We'll and also quickly, Oh, sorry, can I just quickly make a comment? You know, earlier on, we were say, talking about that uh, compassion, but and also not be seen as a doormat. Like, so uh, in Buddhism. Not what? See, be, be uh, seen as a doormat. You just sort of take it, you know, you're being kind and metta and everything, and you just let things go. But could that be also seen as being a doormat that people can trod, tread on you? Walk oh, all over you. Doormat. You have to, as I said, yeah. in response to the other question. Yeah. It's necessary. You have to stand up in order to defend yourself, not just be exploited by others. Mm. Okay. okay let, thank you, Bart. Yeah. Yes. So let us move on now. Okay. So here we have the monk or anybody might say, I've developed and cultivated the liberation of the mind by equanimity and so on, made it my vehicle and basis, carried it out, consolidated, consolidated it and properly undertaken it. And this has been puzzling to me. It says, yet lust still obsesses my mind. And the Pali word here would be raga. Where is my typewriter? Yeah, I seem to have lost my typewriter by the comment box. There it is. Uh, 
Okay, so we have raga still obsesses my mind. And so again, this person should be told, do not say so, don't misrepresent the blessed one, then everything else the same. And then we just come to the last part, for this is the escape from lust, namely the liberation of the mind by equanimity. Let's see what I have in the note. Yeah, I say here, yeah, that's actually a useful note, that the text uses the word raga, and then I speculate that maybe in this context, the word means personal bias rather than sensual desire. And then I had in my notes file, yeah, I took this passage from the from the sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya. This is the sutta to Rahula, the longa sutta to Rahula, where the Buddha says, develop meditation on equanimity. For when you develop meditation on equanimity, any aversion will be abandoned. So you see in the Anguttara Nikaya, lust, which might be understood as favoritism, is the well, personal preference is the opposite of equanimity. Here, aversion is given as the opposite of equanimity. And then I think the situation is cleared up by the explanation in the Visuddhi Magga, where it says that the characteristic of equanimity is the occurrence of impartiality towards beings. And its function is seeing beings as the same or as equal, looking equally upon beings with <coughs> that is, <coughs> that is without making discriminations between beings. And then it says the manifestation is the subsiding of aversion and favoritism or preference, preferring some over others. So upeka is not indifference, but it is overcoming this, these kinds of distinctions, discriminations that we make among people, especially that it could be among beings, if you have a few dogs and you prefer this dog over that dog, that's also a loss of equanimity. <coughs> so treating, yeah, the, this throat soother, it has little particles that get su stuck in the throat. <coughs> Okay, so it is looking equally upon others without distinguishing those that one prefers and those towards whom one has aversion. And, and, that, <coughs> and then its success is the subsiding of aversion and favoritism. <clears throat> so does that settle your question, Samantha? Yes, Bante, I was just going to uh, send a text. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, uh, Bante. Yeah, I, I get it now, thank you. Okay, let us then move on and see if we could complete the sutta. <laughs> yeah, the fifth one is a bit tricky and a little difficult because it uses the claim here. It uses an expression that's not so common in the suttas. That is, it's the animita 
Chaito Vimuti, which I had originally translated as the markless liberation of the mind. Other translators use <clears throat> as the signless liberation of the mind. And we have a note here, according to the commentary, that this is strong insight. But I found the commentary to the Majjhima Nikaya <clears throat> oh, maybe I didn't get that comment. Yeah, I missed that one. Okay. I seem to have lost it. But anyway, the commentary to the Majjhima Nikaya explains that there are, if I remember, 13, yeah, 13 types of liberation of, of the of signless liberation. So one is the samadhi that occurs through strong insight. And then it has the others are the four jhanas the four formless meditations and no strong insight samadhi accompanying strong insight the four formless meditations the four paths noble paths and the four fruits But I don't agree with including the four formless meditations under the category of signless meditation. And if the person, the monk making this claim, had truly attained the four paths and fruits, then he wouldn't be able to say that the opposite, that his mind still follows after signs or marks. So this must be the, I would assume that this is the samadhi that arises through strong and deep insight. <clears throat> and so along with the strong insight, when you have deep insight into, especially into the characteristic of impermanence, than thing or the characteristic of non-self, then things don't appear to be solid, substantial, and enduring. And so you see things as, you know, processes rather than substantial entities. But if somebody has not really successfully developed that signless liberation of mind, then the mind will follow after marks or signs. And these will be the signs that the mind projects onto things as having some nature of being permanent, of being a source of true enjoyment or pleasure in the ultimate sense, and as being a self. So that's the way I would understand that. And so that is the escape from all of these signs or marks of permanence, sukha or pleasurableness and self. That is the markless liberation of mind or signless liberation of mind. The liberation of mind that is reached through deep insight. And then we'll take the sixth root of escape or the element of escape. Okay, here the monk makes the claim, I have discarded the notion, idea, I am. This is us, me, the idea that I have a truly existing I. 
and I don't regard anything as this I am, and yet the dart of doubt and bewilderment or perplexity, maybe that's a better rendering, doubt and perplexity still obsesses my mind. And I just go through a bit quickly, everything else the same, except the conclusion is that this is the escape from the dart of doubt and perplexity, namely the uprooting of the conceit, I am. And this too, I find a bit puzzling. Sometimes one suspects that some distortion has occurred in the transmission of the text. And the reason I indicated in a note Uh, yeah, that there's the problem here is that the disciples from the level, the noble disciples, stream enterer, once returner, non returner, have removed the dart of doubt. So even at the level of stream entry, you eradicate doubt and bewilderment. So the stream enterer knows the truth of the Dhamma and they eradicate the sense or the view of a self but they still have the notion, I am, that idea still lingers in their mind. And then I refer, there's a sutta in the Sangyutta Nikaya, the Kemaka Sutta, where there's a monk named Kemaka, who says that he is free from the view of self, but he's not yet free from the conceit, I am. So it seems a bit puzzling that a opposition is established between the conceit or the notion I am and this dart of doubt and or, or, uh, an opposition between discarding the notion I am and the presence of the doubt, the dart of doubt and bewilderment. Actually, the sense could be actually, actually, I see a way this could make sense. Okay, so the person says, I've discarded the notion I am, and it's only the arhat who's completely finished with the notion I am, and yet he says that he still has doubt and bewilderment. Yeah, so that would imply that the person is not even a stream enterer. Yeah, this could make sense. So you could say, well, you're not even a stream enterer if you have doubt and bewilderment. So how could you say you've gotten rid of I am, the notion I am, which means you're an arhat? Okay, so that would make sense after all. Okay, and so those are the six elements of escape. Okay, I could take now a few remaining questions, and I'll take them in the order in which they came up. So I have to give Gita the chance. Thank you, Bhantibodhi, for your tireless questions. teaching. Yeah, please Thank always you. keep questions short yes. and direct. Thank you, Bhante. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Bhante, my question is on people who are use sarcasm in life. Yeah. Um, how do you have karuna towards them, even if it's a friend, a dhamma friend? Um, how would you navigate such a situation um, without hurting their feelings? but being ever so mindful. Who uses sarcasm towards you? Yeah, like say if they're targeting me. Yeah. You know, and, and they're like saying things um, that are not correct about Buddhism or the teachings of the Buddha. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe they think I'm like a too serious a practitioner, so they want to poke some fun at me. I don't know. <laughs> but... I, I, how do you navigate that, Bhante, tactfully? Okay, okay. If they're using sarcasm, either towards you or towards other, you see them towards other people, you have compassion for them and even metta, loving kindness towards them. And then when you find the opportunity, you take them aside and you have a little chat with them. And just point yes, out. Yes, Bhante. Yeah, that's, I think, yeah. the best way to do it. Or do you just stay quiet? Because I did do that, and then they become rebellious. No, I think you, so, have, of course you have to find the right opportunity, but when you do, then you have to chat with them. Okay. Thank you, yeah. Bhante. It's great. Thank you. Okay, next, Dor Doran. 
Thank you, Bhante, for taking my question. Uh, I wanted to get back quickly to the Upeka equanimity. Yeah. Um, it's my understanding, and my question is uh, whether this makes sense, uh, that equanimity, depending on the context, could take one of two meanings. In one context, for example, the Brahma Viharas, um, what you explain would be in the Visuddhimagga Maga meaning would be that meaning where um, it is more equality and interbeing of humans and how we are all the same. And in another context, um, and I've seen this before appear, uh, when it appears in the factors of enlightenment, it's a different equanimity, is it? It's an equanimity more of uh, stability of mind, uh, not being moved from praise or blamed. In, in yeah, exactly, exactly. There are different types of, of upeka, of equanimity. So that equanimity that comes at the peak of the seven factors of enlightenment would be, probably it would correspond to what is called in the later text, the equanimity in regard to conditioned things. So that would be at the high point of insight where one is just sort of watching, observing phenomena arising and passing and breaking up over and over again without being sort of stirred by them, without giving way to fear of the constant breaking up and vanishing of phenomena and without sort of running away from that dissolution of things. And so it's looking on with a stable, observant mind. Thank you so much, Bhante, for clarifying that. Yeah, the Visuddhi Magga actually distinguishes, I think, in one place, six different types of equanimity. Okay, uh, you're, you're wrong. Yes, thank you, Bhante. In the beginning of the talk today, you mentioned that uh, Cheto Vimuti through Brahma Viharas is considered a temporary liberation. Um, but then when we were talking about, for example, the liberation of the mind by loving kindness, we will have no ill will. You know, the practitioner will have no ill will. But the, doesn't that mean that the person has reached anagami? Or does it is it no, a different level? No, not necessarily. I think what this means is that probably this person the practitioner who's actually made it the vehicle, made it the basis, has established a very, very solid and stable type of loving kindness, Brahma Vihara. And so ill will is not arising in their mind, but, um, and maybe it won't arise, it won't ever arise, maybe on that basis, then they'll develop, just move on to develop the insight wisdom and to achieve the level of Anagami, and then they'll be permanently free from ill will. But, but just if by they having... don't develop wisdom at this point, then they could still have ill will in the future. Is that right? Yeah, as long if they don't develop the wisdom to eradicate the um, ill will at the subtlest level, it could still arise in the future. But as long as they're maintaining that mind liberation of loving kindness, then the ill will won't arise. Thank you very much. Thank yeah, you. Even when they're out of the meditative state, but as long as it's been stabilized and part of their regular practice, then the ill will won't arise. But if they start slipping and becoming negligent, then they can arise again. Thank you. Okay, Ed. Ed. Yes, Bonte, uh, thank you very much. And I have enjoyed this uh, series immensely. Uh, I, w I actually have two questions, but I'm going to spare you one. It's a little okay. more complicating, having, having to do with uh, our Sankara and uh, the vortex that has been called a vortex. But I want to go to the very last item that we talked about, which is uh, some potential confusion between self-view and conceit. And <clears throat> self-view is relatively easy to get rid of among the fetters. It's up in the first three. On the other hand, conceit is down in the last five. I think it's either number three or it's number two or three from the very end. Yeah. And re wrestling with both of these things for quite some time. 
conceit is a much, much, much deeper defilement yeah. than it, but something like self-view. I mean, I and I wrestled with they're the same thing. No, 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 no. I yeah. don't believe they are. Okay, so did you have a question? I wanted you to comment on that because I, I mean, I find it that they're just different. I mean, we went through. Okay, what I would say is that the view of self is much more, let's say, conceptually explicit, conceptually, um, or formulated conceptually. So it's the idea that I explicitly identifying oneself with one or another of the five aggregates, or putting or positing a self in relation to the five aggregates, and holding it as a view, sort of a theory, a philosophical position about the nature of the self. Okay, so that is a view of self, whereas the conceit, what's called the conceit I am, is the very subtle tendency to see a, an I, this, this sort of the stamp, or the notion of I that stamps itself on all of our experience and particularly takes becomes clearest or most visible in the way we rate ourselves and rank ourselves in relation to others as being better, equal, worse. Okay, I could only, I have to move on and take the last question, then we'll have to end for the morning. So this will be Ron. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I put my hand down because I thought we didn't have time. Uh, yes, a couple of things. Uh, you have to keep it to one. <laughs> one, one thing. <laughs> okay. I was just wondering, uh, for uh, the conversation about sincerity, I'm wondering if a better word might be uh, 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 something like solemn or, or grave, because sometimes the definition of sincere is associated with being earnest, wholehearted, genuine i was looking it up i don't think i use the word sincere at all i i use the word serious serious okay yeah not sincere but, sincere yeah no, yeah, no i was uh, the, the definition of serious uh, i was uh, the synonyms for serious sometimes mean sincere or no or, i wasn't thinking of sincerity at all yeah that, that's what i was thinking maybe so solemn or grave or something like well, that Well, solemn is a could be a good Okay. In, in circumstances, it could be a, appropriate move. Okay. Okay, I think we're going to have to end now. So we'll end with the sharing of the merits. Vakasa ta chabumata deva naga mehidika punyantang anumoditva chirangra kantu sasanang. Vakasa ta chabumata deva naga mehidika Punyantang anumoditva, Chirangra kantu desanam, Akasa ta jabumata, Deva naga mehidika, Punyantang anumoditva, Chirangra kantu mangparang, Dukha pata chani dukha, Baya pata chani baya, Soka pata chani soka, Pantu sabepi pani no. May those in suffering be free from suffering. May those in fear be free from fear. May those in sorrow be free from sorrow. May all living beings also be thus. And then we're going to do three bows to the Buddha. I'm going to get the chime and turn to the shrine here. Okay, you're ready to bow. And a bow to Bante. Thank you, 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 Bante.
Thank you, Monte. Take care of your health. Thank you, Monte. 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 Thank you, Thank you, Bante. Thank you, Bante. Thank you, Bante. Thank you, Bante. Be well. Thank you so much. Bante, thank you for Okay, I'm going to end.